Welcome, comrades, to the Spectre of Communism podcast. It's the first episode of the year. We're in a brand new media room, and I can't think of a better subject to kick us off this year than discussing the greatest revolutionary in history, Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, better known as Vladimir Lenin, who led the Bolsheviks to victory in 1917. On Sunday, we marked 100 years since Lenin's death, and we launched a new biography, In Defense of Lenin, which is available to order now from Well Read Books. I'll put a link in the description. And we're very fortunate to have one of the authors of In Defense of Lenin, Rob Sewell, who is a leading comrade with the Revolutionary Communist Party, soon to be the British section of the International Marxist Tendency, and editor of The Communist which is their newly renamed newspaper. Rob, it's so good to have you here. Hi, Joe. It's great to be here. Great. Obviously, we're Marxists. We're not great men of history theorists. We don't think that the character of Lenin, um, his accomplishments and his work can be explained just by delving into his personal history and psychology. But Lenin wasn't born Lenin. Um, The figure of Lenin was the process of political developments, And there was a significance to his background and personal history, the route that took him to politics, to revolutionary activity, and that comes across really strongly and engagingly in the book. So I wondered for our listeners, Rob, if you could just summarize a little bit about Lenin's background, his personal story, and how he became this titanic figure in history. Yes, well... Lenin uh, was born in 1870 uh, at a time of great upheaval in Russia. He uh, he wasn't from the working class, um, but came from a very, quite a privileged background, a uh, part of the intelligentsia in Russia. Um, and it was precisely this class, this intelligentsia, which was going through this great upheaval at the time. Um, and of course, he was affected, his family were affected by these movements. He had, the great uh, rise of the Narodniks, for instance, which was um, became a terrorist organization to overthrow Tsarism, uh, which obviously attracted uh, many of the youth at that particular time, and um, also a, a, a attracted uh, the attention of Lenin's elder brother, Alexander, who joined uh, the terrorist group and uh, was part of a group that was going to carry out the assassination of the Tsar. And he was arrested and eventually hanged. Mm. He was only 21 years of age, which obviously had a big impact on uh, Lenin, as he was expected, his younger brother, as, as he would expect. Mm. His father also um, died uh, a little bit recently before that. And um, he had quite a privileged position in education uh, as a director. And um, his position allowed the family to have a stable income and so on. With, with his death, that also created a, quite a crisis within the family. Um, but Lenin uh, didn't immediately come to the ideas of Marxism. He was um, certainly impressed, first of all, by the, the, the tradition of the Narodniks, the heroicism, if you like, of these young, young people who were prepared to defy everything, give up their, their backgrounds, their privileges, and so on, to, to try and overthrow this, this this dictatorship. And what was the sort of political outlook and character of the Narodniks? Is it correct to say that they based themselves more on the peasantry than on the working class in Russia? Precisely, precisely. They, uh, they was like a, a kind of um, uh, a primitive uh, socialistic uh, viewpoint, but they were basing themselves on, on the peasantry. And they had the idea that Russia itself wouldn't need to go through the, the period of capitalism and that the, the peasantry, who they saw as a revolutionary class, could actually take society forward to a peasant commune, a kind of socialist peasant commune, kind of utopian socialist type of idea. Mm. But uh, that was quite prevalent at the, at, at the time because there was no Russian working class. The Russian working class did not really emerge until the 18, late 1880s, 1890s, when they really came onto the scene. So this was the uh, the kind of uh, revolutionary background, I would say, at that, that time. So how does Lenin find his way to politics? Obviously, his brother was Narodnik, as you explained. Is that how he became political, because of his brother's activities? 
Well, I think it's, 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 there's a number of things, you know, it's the, uh, the effect of, of his brother's politics, the fact that he was hanged, uh, which obviously would, gave rise to a greater hatred for the regime, yeah. that's quite clear. Lots of uh, armchair psychologists in this day and age, the so-called historians will attribute absolutely everything Lenin became to the death of his brother. Yes, yes, but it's obviously a far wider question, the whole ferment in society, the the uh, the oppression of of czarism um all these things um and also lenin uh, was a very intelligent uh, young man uh, he learned uh, a number of languages he was able to read uh, foreign languages and foreign literature and um with that um we see uh, an, uh, other influences if you like bearing down and obviously eventually came into contact with with uh, marx's writings mm. Uh, he didn't immediately uh, um, become a Marxist. That took a pro- that took a bit of time. He didn't, you know, sort of immediately see the light, and that was that was the end of it. He um, he, he groped towards these ideas, um, but he was a sort of character. Once he understood something, he really um, didn't. He didn't do things in half measures. Right. Now Trotsky writes this about Lenin. He said that having found his road to Marxism, testing the ideas to destruction, actually, going through every possible weakness, any possible limitation, finding that, no, actually, this body of ideas was the best available. He then fully committed himself to conquering those ideas. That's right, that's right. But it was a process, because um, uh, in the uh, towns that he settled in, his first circles, if you like, were of, the, of these older Narodnik revolutionaries. He, he, he looked towards, you know, he looked up, to, look, looked up to. But clearly, once he he, he began to to um, discover the ideas of of Marx, which escaped the the, the censor, you know, uh, the volume uh, volumes of Capital, if you know, for instance, escaped the censor because the censor thought that the you know these 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 volumes are so dense, so complicated, they could no Surely, no one would bother to read these things, but they—they they, not only capital but other writings of Marx began to filter through, uh, not least by the, the efforts also by the the, the Pl- Plekhanov group, which was in exile and uh, who were in touch with uh, Marx and uh, Engels, hmm. and they saw their particular role as to disseminate as much of Marx and Engels as possible in the Russian language. Was that the Emancipation of Labour group? That's right, that's right, which, which were in exile. And um, uh, Lenin being, uh, obviously picked up on, on, on different uh, parts of, of uh, Marx's writings. Uh, you know, uh, Andy Dunin, I remember, he, 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 saw and he, he devoured them. The thing about um, the... Uh, of, of Lenin's views... That he 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 didn't just study something. You know, when he took something, he took it very seriously. Mm. And once the the ideas started to open up, the ideas of Marxism, the literature, and so on, the greater idea is greater. If you like concentration, is greater understanding opened up. Uh, later, then he, he came into contact with the writings of Plekhanov, which again were, were a great influence. So, the, uh, on, on the basis of this, the, the ferment of society, these, its personal experiences, the literature that became available, which was all mostly illegal, he then, then became, you know, more and more committed to these ideas, and uh, eventually he decided, decided to commit his life to, this, to the to the revolution and to fight for the ideas of Marxism in Russia. Hmm. Let's talk about ideas, because there's a stereotype about Lenin, which actually isn't contained just to bourgeois histories. You hear it from so-called left-wingers, so-called Marxists. The Stalinists are fond of this debased view of Lenin as just a kind of hard party man. You know, you have Marx, the theorist, Marx, the thinker, and you have Lenin, Lenin almost as more of a practico than a theoretician, but of course this is completely false. Lenin was an extremely advanced theoretician who had a very thorough grasp of Marxism and also made a number of very important contributions, original contributions to Marxist thought. So can we talk about uh, the development of Lenin's ideas? Well, yes, of course, Lenin, to begin with, saw himself as a pupil of um, of Plekhanov. Plekhanov was the, regarded as the father of Russian Marxism. 
Um, uh, but he, was, he came to the movement as a learner. He was keen to learn, keen to understand, to grasp as well as to engage. And of course, the, the movement uh, in the 1890s in particular was in a, a, where there was a lot of confusion in Russia. The small circles were operating. But above all, the ideas of the Narodniks still operated, still, still had a great influence at that time. And therefore, Lenin's first engagement, if you like, uh, um, was to answer these particular questions that uh, uh, the development of, of capitalism would occur in Russia. Mm. With that, there would be an emergence of a working class and that the working class movement should be created and there was a social, a revolutionary social democratic party should be created. Right. Um, but of course, he, um, he uh, with these arguments, he engaged, you know, the movement itself. He was, as I said, he wasn't one for um, half measures. He fully embraced it and he argued and wrote material uh, against the Narodniks and in favor of the Marxist view of history and the development in, in Russia as well. Mm. Well, that's one of Lenin's most important early contributions, and that was the text that I think had the most profound effect on the young Trotsky, and eventually Trotsky ended up in the same party as Lenin. That's a story we'll get to in a little bit. But one thing that really comes across in your book is at every juncture where Lenin is fighting to build the Bolshevik party, uh, well, first the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party, then the Bolshevik Party later on. Um, at every step that he's fighting to keep the forces of Russian Marxism, Russian communism together, he's first and foremost waging an ideological struggle. You look at the period of black reaction between the defeat of the 1905 revolution um, and the eventual victorious 1917 revolution, um, where all sorts of revisionist ideas and idealist um, philosophical trends are finding their way into the party. Um, even at the point where World War One has broken out and the workers of the world are being sent to the trenches to murder each other, Lenin is writing about philosophy. He's writing about the importance of clarity of ideology. It's not like he's taking every opportunity to just fight an organizational battle. He understands that first and foremost, you have to make sure that the party is on a firm theoretical and philosophical foundation. Yes, I mean, even his early writings were uh, one dealing with uh, uh, Marx's philosophy, Marx's economics, and he grew in stature, you know, um, the, f the first struggles, if you like, and, and up to the formation of um, Iskra was a question of um, yeah, clarifying the ideas against uh, the economist trends, which was an opportunist trend yeah. of the legal Marxists. And he, he, t he, 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 with relish, he took up the struggle against these individual tendencies for clarity, to defend the fundamental ideas of Marxism, right. which he then... I mean, he came as a pupil, but then the more he grew, mm. you know, he, he, he went into more depth. He, he, as I said, he didn't just read Marx, he, he studied it, he absorbed it as much as he possibly could. And therefore, he began to build up this knowledge, and with the knowledge, his, his confidence and, and his, his thoughts also about the importance of building the party and how the party would be built. Mm. And you see in, 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 in his writing, you know, what, you know, what is to be done, you know, the, the, the underlines the point that without revolutionary theory, there is no revolutionary movement. And there's a huge stress on, on the need to clarify and defend the fundamental ideas of Marxism and that the party must be based on the solid, these solid foundations. That was the struggle with Iskra. And the Iskra won out. They, they, they were the dominant tendency then. Uh, you know, in, in 1902, 1903, mm. um, they were all Iskra rights. But of course, uh, you have the pressures of capitalism, you know, exerting themselves on the party. And, and with the, within that, different tendencies arose. You mentioned, you know, even after the, well, there's a whole number of, of, of episodes, but the, you mentioned the, the, the defeat of the 1905 revolution. That in itself then led to a whole number of, of, um, of, uh, 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 um, uh, different ideas emerging, looking for shortcuts, you know, uh, a way out, uh, you know, and, and the pressures of capitalism. And there were deviations from the ideas of Marxism. And Lenin held the line, if you like, and philosophically, politically, at each particular juncture, 
theory was the key for for Lenin, and, and throughout his whole entire life, the whole life that, that Marxism wasn't a dogma; it was, it was a guide to action. But theory was the whole basis of the, of the party. I mean, even right up to his his his, his last writings, in 1922. I mean, there's, there's an episode where he had a, an interview with uh, uh, Freina, who was one of the leaders of the American Communist Party, um, and he is. Lenin's health wasn't too too good at the time. He had a short interview. And of all the world subjects he chose to discuss with Freyner, one was the American, uh, where, where the American Labour Party, where that would emerge. Mm-hmm. And the other one was dialectical materialism. Right. You know, the basic philosophical foundations of Marxism. Um, and even, as, I think it was his last public appearance, if either the last or the, or the one before, uh, where he addressed the, the, the Communist International, the Fourth Congress of the Communist International in 1922 in November, he said to the delegates that, um, uh, that, that we, we must t- pressure, we must use every opportunity, every uh, spare moment, uh, where there's relief from war and struggle for us to study and study the fundamentals. That was the last, if you like, uh, Public appeal to the ranks of the Communist International to start to, 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 for them to master the ideas of Marxism. So theory was the key for, for Lenin and the building of the party, building the international. Yeah, and of course, the development of Lenin's stature as a theoretician, you can see in texts like State and Revolution, texts sure. like Imperialism, the Higher Stage of Capitalism, which to this day are touchstones for dealing with these questions, which are still so fundamental for the class struggle. Even in the year 2024, a full century after Lenin's death. I mean, this misunderstanding of Lenin as a kind of grey, tough, joyless party man that's even held in some sections of the left. Of course, the bourgeois, they completely blow up this stereotype when they slander Lenin as this vicious dictator who was completely uncompromising when it came to dissent within the ranks of the party and laid the basis for the, you know, in their words, terrible atrocities of the USSR, the rise of Stalinism. Um, Lenin is probably the most slandered man in history. Central to these bourgeois slanders is the idea that Lenin was this brutal dictator. Um, and they always tie it back. They always say that the first evidence, the first glimpse of the monster that Lenin was to become um, is in 1903 with the split between the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks um, at the Second Congress of the RSDLP, where Lenin, um, you know, without any regard for the um, the democratic rights or the um, hurt feelings of the fellow travellers and respected members of the party was imposing his control over the Iskra editorial board. And they say, this is where you see Lenin, the dictator, beginning to emerge. Um, what, a very different picture of Lenin comes across in the book. What do you say to this charge that Lenin was a, was a horrible dictator? On the contrary, I would say he was very amenable, you know, to his comrades, to his his his, his, his collaboration. Uh, prick in the early years with with Plekhanov, who was all, who was a bit of a prickly character. Yeah, didn't like Trotsky very much, Plekhanov. He, he didn't. He didn't. He didn't. Um, when Lenin proposed that Trotsky come onto the editorial board, because Lenin was looking for for new blood, fresh. He was always looking out to involve people to for the for the benefit of the movement. And to, to, to harness the talents that was available, but uh, yes, Plekhanov was was um, did, didn't like the newcomers, if you like, and uh, he was quite a difficult person, I suppose, to to get on with. But um, Lenin was able to to collaborate with him, and uh, despite the, the the clashes and difficulties, um, and and to and to if you like create a, a working team in relation to to Iskra. But then also Lenin had a serious side insofar as, um, you know, the development of the revolution is a serious question. And, mm. and uh, the development of, of the party throws up, uh, obviously, different problems at different stages. And the stage they had in 1902, 1903 was to, to um, not just wage a successful uh, ideological battle to, to win the argument for Marxism, but also to, to develop the party not as a, um, a loose net or going to, you know, uh, because of the character of the, of the period they were dealing with. And um, 
you know, they had to break out of the circle mentality. Because many of the, the early uh, origins of the party were based on circles. And this mentality of a, cir of a circle. And the attempt to professionalize the party, that's all it was. Mm. Um, and of course, um, it, it, it stepped on a few toes, if you like, and uh, uh, bruised feelings. And uh, uh, this got this uh, manifested itself in, in the split in 1903. And um, yes, uh, of course, his enemies would always say, oh, you know, he, that Lenin uh, behaved in a, in a belligerent fashion and so on. And all he did was argue his point, mm. <laughs> you know, in, in, in the best way possible, explain his ideas, argue his point. There was no... Um, big stick being waved. There was no authoritarian background. It was a question of trying to, of convincing people, and that's all it was. And in 1903, at the, 1903 at the Second Party Conference, anyway, he was in the minority for quite a period of it. Um, and he accepted it, and uh, eventually won a, a majority because of a walkout from uh, the, the economists and, and, and such like. Um, and even after the split, Lenin attempted to, to heal matters. It was the, 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 the Mensheviks and around Martov who were trying to create a, uh, an impossible situation of sabotaging the situation. And Lenin went out of his way again and again and again in order to try and bring them back on board. Mm. So, if, you know, the reality is that it wasn't... It, well, I would also say that the party itself wasn't simply a... A discussion club, clearly, right, and that uh, you know, it was often said that the the Bolshevik Party was a was a school of hard knocks insofar as the you know, you know, it, it was the rough and tumble of debate, of discussion, of of to clarify and so on, not br brush things under the carpet. But they weren't done in in, in any um, belligerent form. It was a question of arguing out politically uh, the case, being making a case, if you like, and um, of course the bourgeois. Uh, um, uh, historians always like to um, uh, get as much uh, dirt, as if you like, from Lenin's opponents uh, to, to slandering, basically. And uh, I would say that it is a complete slander. He always attempted to um, reach out to people. Yeah. In uh, in even well, throughout even after 1905, even where Plekhanov went over to to, to the Mensheviks and so on. He tried to get, make make some agreements with with, uh, with uh, uh, Plekhanov in relation to preserving the party, mm. you know. Later on, so this this caricature he was just a ruthless. It's just nonsense. Yeah. And when it came down to it, what the split ultimately represented was a political um, difference between revolution and reformism, and where Lenin decides finally that trying to reconcile the party was a fool's errand, is where he becomes fully convinced of that yes, difference. But, he, but they also spent a number of years trying to get agreement. Right. Trying to unify. And they did unify him, but it broke down. And the reason why the unity broke down was because the, precisely the differences, the political differences that were emerging. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, by 1912, then Lenin looks said, look, this is, this is now ridiculous. This is, this has become a complete impasse. You know, and we have to draw the conclusion that the Bolsheviks needed to carry the banner themselves, to declare themselves a, a party and fight for the, the genuine ideas of Marxism, yes, of revolution. Mm. Another thing that comes across in the book, and I also remember coming across in Allen's um, book, Bolshevism, Road to Revolution, about the history of the Bolshevik Party, obviously Marxists don't deny the importance, sometimes the singular importance of individuals in history, um, and Lenin's particular role in the road to the Russian Revolution is, is really striking. It feels like every time he's out of town, every time he's not able to personally steer the Bolsheviks in the correct direction, they start deviating like, un under the leadership of um, second-rate figures like Kamenev and Stalin and Zinoviev. Every time Lenin's not around, um, they start making mistakes. They start moving in the direction of a conciliation with the reformists. Um, they take a sectarian attitude to the Soviets uh, when they first get established that Lenin has to correct. It seems like the, the fate of the Russian Revolution and the fate of the Bolshevik Party is almost, it's almost singularly <laughs> bound up in the figure of Lenin. Yes, I mean... It uh, Lenin, you know, helped to develop the, the, this idea of Bolshevism, although he, didn't, he never saw it as a separate 
uh, kind of tendency. You know, he just they thought he was just upholding the genuine ideas of of Marxism within the movement. That's all. And um, uh, the idea that uh, you know he was uh, belligerent, getting his many many times that Lenin was in the minority, even in the minority of one. Yeah, well, in terms of the seizure of power um, sure, upon returning to the Finland station in April 1917, he was in the minority. Sure, throughout the whole history of the party, you know, he he he, he was not always in a in a majority. The and question of the, uh, of the First World War as well. Um, there was a whole number of cases, a whole number of cases, uh, which goes against the narrative of him him being a dictator in the party and all the rest of it. He yeah. he went along actually with. With certain things like uh, you know like the boycott ta- tactic and so on, and, and you know, after 1907, 1908, um, he, he didn't agree with it, but nevertheless he went along with it. And ho- on the basis of experience, that's the whole point. He thought that the party would rectify the mistakes, right? And therefore, he he always uh, had an understanding. It wasn't a question of, of um, laying down the law, but of arguing the case and showing by throwing by experience that that the, his ideas or his way was correct. I mean, the greatest advantage that Lenin had, of course, was that um, yes, he was he, he grasped the, the whole method of Marxism in such a way, uh, in a superior way than others. I mean, on the other hand, he made mistakes, but fewer than other people. Yeah, and above all, he learned from his mistakes. And he, I mean, when le- reading uh, Lenin's uh, writings uh, throughout uh, the collected works and so on. What really strikes you is the honesty of Lenin, the yes. complete and utter honesty, not uh, throwing difficulties away and, and brushing them under the carpet, bringing them out and answering them clearly, but not, not to to um, to look for a shortcut above all, you yeah. know, but to st- face reality as it is in order to overcome any problems and build for the future. I think that it really says something about the charlatanry and philistinism of our modern bourgeois historians that they see honesty as ruthlessness. I think a lot of the time they just don't like to see somebody who's firm and convinced in their ideas and honestly and clearly demonstrating where they stand and pointing in the right direction. And the fact is, history bore Lenin out. The fact is, the Russian working class with the Bolsheviks at their head, um, and the peasantry as well, of course, were able to take power. Yeah, so obviously the, the, the bourgeois historians are... Um, the services and the fighters. Yes, and all, all of them are the, same, are the same stable, really. They, they're all there to... Attempt to distort and to, to um, blacken the name of Lenin because obviously they, they, they are very conservative, they're anti communist, and their, their whole role is to, yes, not to, to bring out the truth, but just to undermine and distort and uh, blacken the name of, of Lenin and of revolution. It's as simple yes. as that. And they use anything, any means at their disposal, they use. And, of course, they twist and turn. They, they take one quote from Lenin for one period, put it in another period, different context. They deliberately twist everything in order to make him, you know, um, fit into their narrative, as they say, you know, mm. of this kind of um, fiend yes. who's, who's uh, manipulating the working class and uh, who's undemocratic and all the rest of it. This is all nonsense. This is what they have to put out. They do this mm. in order to try and... Uh, ensure that what? our workers and youth who are looking towards revolution are turned off by Lenin because he is the road to dictatorship. Yeah, don't follow his example. It, precisely, you know, and the, the Leninism leads to Stalinism. All this nonsense is churned out day in, day out mm. by these individuals in order to try and prevent uh, workers and youth drawing conclusions or moving towards these particular ideas. To mark 100 years since the death of Lenin, the great Marxist revolutionary and leader of the October Revolution, our international is launching a brand new biography, In Defense of Lenin, written by Rob Sewell and Alan Woods. The book traces Lenin's life and works and explains his real ideas, defending his colossal heritage against over a century of capitalist myths and slanders. Pre-order your copy at wellreadbooks.com. That's wellread-books.com. I mean, aside from Lenin's political integrity, which informs that firmness we've been talking about, to be honest, if you read his uh, writings and particularly his letters and correspondences of members of the party, a, a great deal of humanity comes across. I oh, mean, yes. he, he's always asking after people's health. 
He's um, got a real, a genuine abiding uh, concern for the well-being of the Russian people, especially the, in the very dark period of the Civil War. There's one part of the book which um, I actually found very moving, which was at the height of the Civil War, Russia's been invaded by 21 foreign armies, the revolution's being strangled. Uh, it's a desperate life-or-death struggle to preserve the victory of October 1917. And you've got leading members of the Bolshevik party literally starving in official buildings trying to carry out their their duties mm-hmm. and then instead um you have to say the last lump of sugar the last crust of bread the last scrape of butter for the children because we adults can survive on anything but we have to make sure that the kids are fed i mean this doesn't speak to the monstrous caricature that we're constantly assailed with from the official histories of the russian revolution that's sort of Lenin led a very uh, humane, modest life, if you want to put it that way. Quite ascetic, actually. There's, there's another anecdote. Um, I can't remember if it's in the book, actually, but it's one that I remember where mm-hmm. in his official offices there was a chair that he liked, but it had a nail sticking out. And rather than have the chair replaced, he asked if someone could give him a hammer to knock the nail in. I mean, this is a guy who was literally at the, the head of this new regime, um, working in very, very modest conditions. I mean, nothing resembling the monstrous privileges that the Stalinist bureaucrats of the, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s and onwards were enjoying. Not like, you know, Brezhnev's wife and her fleet of cars and this sort of thing. No, he was repelled by any form of privilege. Right. And, uh, um, like all his, like the, the ministers, they were, they, they, they lived on, on a, a salary, which was a basic salary. It yeah. was a salary of uh, a skilled worker. Yeah. And um, they, uh, in other words, they didn't have these privileged positions you have in bourgeois society and so on and so forth for ministers uh, living in luxury. On the contrary, they lived with extremely modest living standards. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they, and uh, even uh, the, the offices in the Kremlin and so on, it's just, it's, 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 yeah, a few chairs, tables, very, very uh, modest outlook. Um, and that this was all of, of Lenin's uh, position because he based himself on the position of the Paris Commune that the mm-hmm. you know representatives and officials and so on of, of the working class must live at the, uh, on the living, same living standards as the, of the working class. Mm. And there must be no privileges, and that's why he fought against bureaucracy and so on and privilege and careerism. All this was a, a fight that uh, uh, Lenin had, and. Um, of course, they're trying to, all this is trying to, they're trying to distort this. The bourgeois historians try and distort this and his privileges. Look at the privileges he had and so on. So, which, which is, which is nonsense. No, I mean, there's another anecdote in the book where you say that he, even having taken power, um, the Bolsheviks being in charge of the country, he didn't like to be driven around in a party car. He preferred to walk amongst the people. But, of course, eventually you've had the problem of provocateurs and assassins and so on. And he eventually conceded. Um, and there's another story about some workers at a garment factory who made Lenin a coat for his birthday. Yes. And he sent them a polite letter back saying, thank you so much, comrades, but please don't send me presents. You know that you shouldn't give me presents. That's right. Um, you know, this was the kind of person Lenin was. And I don't make this as a kind of sentimental point about you know Lenin's morality. I'm saying that Lenin's character was a reflection of his politics. He, he, he honestly embodied precisely the political objectives that he set himself. Yes, he didn't like, he didn't like the pomp, if you like. He didn't mm. like this, this grandeur, none of that. It, it was alien to him. Right. And um, that's why he stood out. That's why people looked up to him as, as, as a, a genuine revolutionary mm. who dedicated his life to the working class itself. Yes. And uh, it was remarkable. Well, even when he... He was uh, his first ass- the assassination attempt in, in August 1918, where he was shot. Yeah, but by Fanny and, Kaplan. Yes, but what was remarkable, he still had the coat, that particular coat that he was shot, and he, he kept wearing that. The, the the bullet holes were stitched up, and he kept on wearing that particular coat. Mm. I mean, um, it just shows the kind of, um, yeah, of course, here it was, it was a question also of the, the example to be set, and we were all in the same boat, if you like, and they were like, and because the conditions that were that the the the, the masses um, endured 
you know, after 1918, 1919, 1920, 21, during the, as you said, in, in relation to the civil war and the invasion of, of 21 foreign armies, the destruction of, of, of Russia, the famine, the, the disease, and so on, the, the terrible conditions that they, 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 they lived under. And uh, there was no privilege under those, those, those circumstances. Lenin lived with the people, lived for them and with them. Yeah, and it's very clear in the biography that very close and genuine relationship that the Russian masses felt towards Lenin. I mean, this was a figure who, more than any political figure in history, genuinely embodied their aspirations. Yes, I mean, in the, of course, uh, it was a backward country. That was the... Um, right. And Lenin was always very um, sober-minded about that. He was always Precisely. talking about the level of literacy, about the technical level of the working class. He didn't have a... Um, an unrealistic or utopian perspective on the Russian people. No, you know, there were enormous difficulties in coming to power in Russia because of the um, backwardness of the country, the isolation of the revolution, and so on and so forth. And he always knew that the only way out for the revolution was world revolution. Mm. And that was, the again, one of the, the key aspects of Lenin was the struggle, a recognition that the Russian revolution wasn't... Uh, socialism in one country as if you could establish socialism in the confines of one of the most backward countries of the world it was impossible that socialism can only exist on a world scale and the tasks of the working class are international tasks the overthrow of capitalism throughout the, the 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 world and establishing a world federation of socialist states and therefore the the the, the work the the need for the the socialist revolution international nationally was born then uh, from the well, uh, uh, the the need for the, for the communist international to be created, creating uh, uh, mass parties internationally and so on, with the express purpose not of carrying through a national revolution, but an international revolution. Right. I mean, in future episodes, we'll obviously deal in more detail with particular aspects of Lenin's thoughts and his activity, his attitude to, to war, the development of the internationalist um, faction at Zimmerwald. We'll talk about uh, particular theoretical contributions around imperialism and his um, debates with the British communists over left-wing communism and, and so on. But I wanted, before we let you go, to talk about the connection between Lenin and two other key figures in the history of the Russian Revolution, which is Trotsky and Stalin. Um, ultimately, Trotsky and Lenin ended up as the key leaders of the Russian Revolution, but they had various periods in their life and in their political trajectories where they were further apart and closer. They had a number of debates on a number of questions, um, and much is made by the Stalinists of the... Um, the vicious invective that Lenin and Trotsky were always throwing at each other. They they dragged these quotes out of context where Lenin and Trotsky were debating on various things. They talk about the fact that Trotsky didn't join the Bolsheviks until 1917 to say that there was a gulf separating these two men. But is that really the case? Well, uh, of course, um, at the end of the day, you could say that um, Lenin and Trotsky were, were one insofar as the, the, the revolution 1917 brought them together and they provided the leadership for the revolution itself. They, they agreed completely. And that, that uh, uh, took place on the basis of a, a previous period, which you are correct. They were, first of all, when um, Trotsky uh, met with Lenin, they, they established quite a, a good working relationship in 1902 in, in Iskra and so on and so forth. Um, and as I said, that the the Lenin wanted uh, Trotsky to become a member of the editorial board of Iskra, but Plekhanov uh, vetoed it. Mm. Um, and during the 1903 Congress, the Second Congress, uh, Trotsky was a complete supporter of Lenin. He was regarded as the, the Lenin's cudgel. It was mm. said. Um, Trotsky was a young man. He was, he, was, he was taken back by Lenin's firmness in the uh, uh, Second Congress um, when Lenin wanted to firm the party up, if you like, and above all, um, to recognize that the uh, editorial board was uh, not functioning as it should be and that some of the older editorial board members weren't uh, pulling their weight mm. and therefore there needed to be a change. We needed to prof professionalize the work. 
and um, his proposal uh, kind of was 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 uh, uh, was a shock for Trotsky, who had a certain admiration for the old types, the old guard, and so on and so forth. He was sentimental in that respect. Um, but what what do you see then is that uh, um, Trotsky, although although sides with with the Martov in in the, in the Second Congress, very quickly breaks away because of the political differences that emerge now, and that, that's the main point to understand is the is the is the political evolution that takes place um, after the split, where the Mensheviks become more and more uh, supportive of the liberal bourgeoisie. Well, of a st- of a stagist theory of revolution, and Lenin rests upon the working class as the real uh, motive force in the uh, revolution against Tsarism, in co- obviously in con- by co- conjunction with the peasantry. Um, and if there was a big difference, if you like, on that, those lines, if the, the difference between class collaboration and class independence, um, but within that you have a, also the the position of Trotsky. Which is, uh, is 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 different insofar as, although it's quite close to Lenin's position, that the um, leading force of the revolution should be the working class. He believed that the working class could come to power in Russia, and carry out a socialist revolution, which uh, was the he was the only one to put this idea forward. Um, and it was in 1917. Uh, on the basis of the experience, if you like, of the, of the war and the revolution, that Lenin himself came round to that position, that it wasn't quite a question of a bourgeois revolution any longer, uh, but of a, of a socialist revolution. And he had to carry out a, a real struggle within the, the Bolshevik party uh, in April 1917 to win them over to that viewpoint, mm. to uh, have a, uh, to, to, to link, to... to to guide the party now to the second revolution, and that coincided with Trotsky's political view that the, uh, which was called the permanent revolution, that the working class could come to power on the basis of a socialist revolution. So politically, Lenin and Trotsky's ideas fused in in 1917. The allegation that Trotsky remained outside the Bolshevik Party, well, it's true he did remain outside the uh, outside the Bolshevik Party. He remained outside the, the well, first of all the, of the of the two tendencies outside the Bolshevism and Menshevism, which are two factions of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party, he took an independent view, and he hoped that they would be able to be, he could conciliate these uh, two tendencies. He hoped that, that the, the best types of both factions could come together and 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 and, re, and, and rebuild the party. Mm. Uh, but that was not the case. It couldn't be done. Yeah. Um, so it, so so. Trotsky's weakness was a weakness of conciliationism, yeah. and that you overcome that, yeah. like on the basis of the experience, you also begin to recognise there's no way forward on the basis of unity between the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks, and that the that Lenin's Bolshevik party was the only way forward. So he comes over to to Lenin's viewpoint in 1917. So they both connect, if you like, politically and organisationally, and their talents combine to lead the Bolshevik party to power in 1917. And not only that, then afterwards, Trotsky becomes the, really the key the, the key uh, person that, that Lenin relies upon politically, mm. first of all in building the Red Army, but also uh, p- politically as well in, in maintaining the right course after the revolution. In relation to Stalin is a different point, because yes. Stalin is, is a... Is a uh, a mediocre figure in the Bolshevik party. He's, yeah, he is considered a practical, whereas the leaders of the Bolshevik party were, were mainly theoreticians, um, had a broad outlook on, on, uh, on the revolution, both in Russia and internationally, whereas Stalin had a very uh, narrow backward view of the party. And it was a, 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 a party apparatchik, if you like, and a, and a, and a, and, uh, he uh, only emerges in the background. He emerges, uh, um, well, first of all, you could say, in 1917, he comes back from exile, internal exile. Um, and him and um, Kamenev uh, take over the editorship or editorship of the Pravda and, and really have a conciliatory line towards the provisional government. So the they, Pravda being the Bolshevik par- uh, party paper. Exactly. They... 
uh, steer the bo- before Lenin arrives back, they take charge of the party and they make, uh, if you like, uh, make the right royal hash of it. Absolutely, and it takes uh, the return of Lenin then in April to steer the party because party, the party didn't have, a, have a, a view of of the socialist revolution. If anyone's not clear and just how bad of a deviation it was, we're talking about the bourgeois government of Kerensky that wanted to keep Russia in the war, that was refusing to carry out even the most basic demands of the Russian workers and peasantry. It was a completely counter-revolutionary and reactionary outfit that Stalin and Kamenev were dragging the Bolsheviks towards. Yes, the, the, it was a, the Prussian government was a bourgeois government. And the, the, the Soviets, which are th- were thrown up by the revolution, yeah. were dominated by the, the Mensheviks and social revolutionaries, who in turn uh, gave uh, all-hearted support to the provisional government to yeah, maintain the war and so on and so forth, refused to give the, the land to the peasants. And uh, it took Lenin to come back from exile. And there was only one person actually in the, inside the Bolshevik party in leadership at that time who supported him, and that was uh, 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 Kalantai. Mm. The rest didn't support him at all. And they dissociated themselves from Lenin. They said that Lenin was become a, a Trotskyist, good God. These ideas were, you know, uh, you know, the, he's, he's gone ultra left. And it took a bit, a bit of a struggle within the party, but Lenin won a basis of support amongst the rank and file. That's the main thing. And eventually, uh, man, they managed to win over the, over the party. All, all those opponents began to, to fall, fall into the line, if you like. And the, and the political perspective of the party, the whole prognosis of the party, changed to the need to fight for a socialist revolution. Mm. Um, and obviously on that basis, Trotsky returns also to um, uh, Russia. And he independently came to the view also that, of, the, you know, the, of the, the, so- the Soviets which have been thrown up and the need for a second revolution. And uh, as soon as he gets back, he discusses with, with Lenin, Lenin and, and Trotsky agrees that they, he should stay in a small group called the, called the Mezryonsky, which is about 4,000 very advanced uh, workers in, in Petrograd, and for him to win them, them over to the Bolshevik party, which they did. And, and mm-hmm. that was the case in, in um, July, August 1917. Uh, but Trotsky was 100% in agreement with Lenin uh, and the Bolsheviks in 1917. Uh, joins the party and becomes a key leader mm. of the party, whereas uh, Stalin is in the background. And Stalin, I mean, he has certain characteristics. Stalin, not only is he a bit, he's a bit narrow-minded, but he, he's a bit of a tough guy as well, you know, yeah. and uh, can carry things through. And um, under those circumstances, under certain circumstances, those are qualities, particularly in the Civil War period after the Revolution, which were which were needed in order to try and galvanize, try and you know, it maintained what the, 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 the defense of the revolution in the isolation. Mm. But um, Stalin became more and more the figurehead of, the, of this growing bureaucratic reaction within the young workers' state because of right. the isolation, because of the backwardness. As Lenin explained, they, they managed to create a worker state, but it was like uh, 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 the old czarist machine, the old czarist state, and anointed with some Soviet oil, you right? Know? Yeah, because very few could read and write. For instance, you know, illiteracy was seventy percent of the population, so they had to rely on on the old officials and the old czarist uh, um, administrators and so on, to keeping them under check and control as far as they could. But of course, when in the civil war period, with the devastation that was taking place, the the the, the famine that was taking place, the the dislocation that was taking place. It was, ex- you know, it, they were just hanging on by their fingertips. Lenin described it as, a, you know, a, a besi- a, being, being in a besieged fortress. And on, on those conditions, you had the, 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 the rise of a bureaucratic reaction within the revolution, within the state. These officials coming back and also coming into the party. And Stalin began to represent and... and uh, reflect the outlook of this bureaucratic reaction. Right. I mean, we had Nicholas speaking on International Marxist Radio last year about Stalin and about how he was very adept at pulling together all of the people who'd had their egos bruised by Lenin and Trotsky, all of these petty bureaucrats and officials who were looking for personal advancement and privilege and prestige. And Stalin 
using the advantages of being in the background, was able to acquire, quietly accrue power within the state's apparatus. And the last portion of uh, the biography that you and Alan have written, it captures this tragic double process where on the one hand, the objective situation is souring, the world revolution hasn't come to pass, but also Lenin himself is weakening because as you explained, he was shot uh, by Fanny Kaplan. He never really fully recovered from uh, that assassination attempt. And he suffered a series of strokes, which eventually left him debilitated. Yes, I mean the, the position in Russia was it was um, extremely difficult. You can't imagine it. Um, I mean, nineteen nineteen twenty, you know, uh, probably half the population of of, of Petrograd and, and 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 Moscow, you know, were deserts. You know, for the, in, in order to find food in the countryside, if they could, there was starvation. There was even report of cannibalism in certain areas. It was in, in an extremely difficult position all around. Um, after the, 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 the First World War, then the Civil War, uh, the blockade in, in particular. I mean, uh, uh, the Soviets, after, after all, which were, were strong organizations in 1917, with the working class being, being uh, atomized under these conditions, you know. Um, the Soviets began to fall more and more into, into, into disrepute. They, 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 didn't, uh, they didn't operate, they didn't function, because the working class didn't function. They were basically sc- scraping around for scraps to, to eat and feed their right. families. Well, the best layers have probably been killed in the war or were exhausted from having been in the first charge. Absolutely. The, the best layers, the communist layers, went to the front. They were the ones who were killed or even absorbed into the, the state apparatus. After all, there were like 3 million industrial workers in Russia out of, out of 150 million uh, peasants. So this very thin line of, of the proletarian state, if you like, ho- trying to hold the line. And at, at, at the top, the Bolshevik party, and Lenin, if you like, you know, holding that together and so on. And yet these terrible pressures, and obviously the first pressure was the, the isolation, the failure of, of the German Revolution in 1918. Mm. You know, it was a catastrophe. And then followed by other defeats and the further isolation. And, those, and Lenin believed that the revolution was doomed. If you couldn't spread the revolution to the West, get su- such was the, the, the objective problems facing, that it, it would collapse. It would, it would be doomed. It was Because it, it's impossible to build things on, the, on, those, on those terms. Um, but they managed to, just to hold on with, by their fingertips. But in 1922, uh, early 22, when uh, 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 Stalin was, was appointed general secretary on the initiative of, of Zinoviev, mm-hmm. who had a certain eye as well on, 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 the, on the leadership, um, and, and, and Lenin wasn't that keen on, on the idea. In fact, he said that this was, you know, this, this, this chef will, will prepare peppery dishes, you know. He yeah. wasn't very keen on the idea at all. But as long as Lenin was in, you know, had a firm hand on the, on the tiller, if you like, then that, then, then things could be held into place. And, um, that was the case. But unfortunately, you know, I think it was in April 1922, you have the first stro- a stroke and that puts him out of action. Uh, and he doesn't come back to work until October 1922. And in that period of time, his absence from the Kremlin, when he comes back, he can see for himself the growing danger of bureaucratism and how it's feeding into the party and the problems of that, that that arises, you know, and therefore problems over the you know the monopoly of foreign trade, for instance, it becomes a battle over that. You know, um, it's a question of the jaw of Georgia and the national question where where where. Stalin is also manipulating and so on because he's in charge of the, of the nationalities mm. and, he's, and he has a very bureaucratic approach yeah. to the whole problem. That's his whole narrow uh, vision of, of things. But uh, Lenin, when Lenin comes back to the Kremlin, he's, he's alarmed in October and, and uh, has a meeting with Trotsky to agree that they form a block against bureaucracy in, the, in, 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 in you know, and a fight against bureaucracy. And, uh, Len- and and Trotsky says he he was a bit hesitant because that would mean a fight you know against the tops and that meant Stalin as well. Mm. Uh, but they said no, they they needed to carry this thing through to the end. Yeah. Unfortunately, um, within a short space of time, Lenin suffers further strokes, which puts him you know, puts him out of action. Mm. And that's where he writes this his famous testament, mm. where he he calls for the removal of um, of, of of Stalin 
from his position, but it, it becomes too late in effect. We should also say that Stalin was using his position to personally isolate Lenin, controlling the correspondences that he received, oh, yes. trying to prevent Lenin from having too much of a sense of just how bad things have become. Oh yes, he was maneuvering all the time. And of course, they began to maneuver with Kamenev and Zinoviev to keep Trotsky out of the leadership. They were concerned if, if Lenin was to die, then Trotsky would take over the leadership, you know, of 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 the party and of the state. And they, they through personal reasons, there was nothing political. It was personal that they wanted to prevent uh, this upstart, as they saw it, this newcomer, you know, Trotsky, this new this clique that was formed, the Troika of Stalin, Zinoviev, and, and Kamenev, began to manipulate behind the scenes. Then, uh, but Kamenev and Zinov and Zinoviev thought they were manipulating Stalin. You know, mm. they thought, well, you know, who is he compared yeah. to them? That was a fatal mistake. In fact, yes, he was. He had he had his fingers in in more pies. He had he, he had the connections in the regions in the opposition, starting from the military opposition. Uh, you know, a few years ago, mm. a few years before, and with that, he begins to appoint uh, different secretaries and appoint people in different positions. In other words, he was. Developing his own power yeah. base, maneuvering his yes men into key positions. Yes, his own power base within the party itself, which is going stronger and stronger because the bureaucratic reaction that was taking place as well, uh, with St uh, with Lenin out of the out of the picture, um, they they formed a faction within inside the, uh, uh, the 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 Central Committee. Well, not just the Central Committee within the Politburo. They mm. they met secretly, you know. Uh, Trotsky was left out, out, of course, and they decided everything. And one of the decisions was that Stalin be responsible for the liaison of of the of, of the of the doctors and and, mm. and the Politburo with Lenin. So he was put in a very key position, if you like. And with that, he attempted to isolate Lenin from news, from any developments, and was was frightened, if you know, particularly when they when Stalin found out. About the contents of the of the testament, because mm. that was his, that would be the death knell of yeah. Stalin. He would finish politically, so he attempted then to more and more isolate Lenin, more with his secretaries and so on and so forth. Who could see him? Who couldn't see him? It was a real, I feel like, fight from the point of view of Stalin to maintain Lenin's isolation in order to protect Stalin's future career prospects. Should we say so? He had control of Lenin's doctors. Yes. This isn't the Joe Rogan podcast. We don't peddle in conspiracy theories on this show. But is it possible that Stalin, at the very least, manipulated the situation to hasten Lenin's death? Well, yeah, well put, it, put it this way. If Lenin had recovered, mm. Stalin would be finished. Right. Right, that's the first premise. So it's a mighty convenient that he so, died when he did. Yeah, yes, so, so Stalin was, was clear that he could not tolerate this situation of, of Lenin's recovery. Uh, now, obviously, Lenin was very sick. Uh, he, was, he was so ill that at one point he mentioned to um, uh, Krupskaya, and through Krupskaya to Stalin. Krupskaya being his wife. Yes. Uh, of whether he could take poison at a certain point if it, if things became so bad, mm. and he actually asked Stalin whether he would provide that poison. Stalin said he had refused because he obviously he didn't want to carry it through, and he reported the, this this episode to the Politburo. But it was quite a, a it's quite a fishy episode, if you like. But mm. so there's a lot of things going on here. Stalin had the means, he had the motive. You know, he had the access to all these things. And as we know in the future, Stalin was quite ruthless and prepared to murder the entire, well, anybody who's left of Lenin's Central Committee in order mm. to, consol to consolidate power. So uh, Trotsky raises it in his book, uh, Stalin, that uh, yes, that uh, it's quite possible that uh, Stalin carried through the poisoning of Lenin mm. at that point. Well, I mean, Krupskaya herself said that had Lenin lived, he would have ended up in one of Stalin's gulags. Um, recognizing that the counter-revolution at that point had acquired a logic of its own. I, I mean, we'll never know for sure. But as you say, uh, the means and motive are all there. Um, not a true crime podcast either. So I think we'll probably just advise that readers pick up a copy of the biography and draw their own conclusions. Well, there, there was a, a conference that took place in the United States uh, dealing with... Uh, 
cases, uh, unusual cases of, of deaths of leaders and so on. And one of those uh, dealt with Lenin's death. And they tried to, to you know, to, to re-examine all the... Because there was no to autopsy done. There was a, it was a strange combination of things that were happening at the time. And uh, a number of these top, top uh, doctors and scientists pointed to the idea that uh, this is extremely unusual mm. that Lenin would have died in this particular way. Um, and anyway, they, there's, there's, there's a lot of um, uh, evidence or circumstantial evidence to point mm. in the direction that there was this uh, move towards uh, poisoning Lenin on the behalf of Stalin. But either way, Lenin's death was, was a, a great relief for Stalin because, as I said, if Lenin had lived then Stalin would have been removed, his career would have been completely finished. Yes, and then the Stalinists are moved immediately to transform Lenin into a harmless icon that they could plaster all over banners and posters and build statues of while completely deviating from the content of his ideas. And the last thing I want to talk about, just to end this really interesting discussion, we could go on for hours, I know, but people really should read the book. In a certain sense, the Stalinists and the bourgeois historians who slander Lenin they do so in the same way, because they claim that Stalinism is the authentic continuation of yes. Leninism. The Stalinists obviously claim it in a positive sense. They say that they're the real, the real Leninists. They understand the need to build a hard, practical party, and we inherited the party that carried through the Russian Revolution, so on and so forth. Whereas the bourgeois historians say that the gulags, all the deaths under Stalin, the famines, the mismanagement, the dictatorship, that was all the results of Lenin's ideas and Lenin's influence over the development of the Bolshevik party. And obviously they're both wrong. They're wrong for different reasons. Um, reasons that I hope we've dealt with over the course of this discussion and that you certainly deal with in the book. But just to finish off, why is it that communists defend Lenin's legacy today? Because I'm sure some would say Lenin's been in his grave for a hundred years now. Um, people on the left might even say, look, we all want socialism. We all want to put an end to the horrors of capitalism. But um, isn't Lenin a bit of a, a divisive figure? Isn't he a bit of a turnoff for some people? Why is it that we think it's important to stand up in defense of Lenin? Well, I think first and foremost is, 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 the, is the, the times we are living in, in so far mm. as uh, we are faced now with the deepest crisis of capitalism, probably in its history, uh, that uh, wherever you look, there's the war, upheaval, instability, and there's not going to be a solution to all this. This is a deep and fundamental crisis of capitalism, which is going to have, a, is having, not has, is having an impact a major impact on the way people are thinking, consciousness, young people in particular. As we said, you know, uh, in the opinion polls, which have come out in Britain, America, and so on, where, where millions of young people are open to the ideas of communism, which they weren't before. In other words, the, it's precisely in this period of crisis and an interest in communism and need to change society that um, Marxism becomes more and more relevant and within Marxism, Lenin also becomes more and more relevant and dangerous from the point of view of the ruling class. And Lenin um, made an enormous contribution to the ideas of Marxism, developed those ideas. And they are very important. They are a treasure, treasure trove, if you like, for the young people of today, for us today to learn from. It's not a question of a history lesson. This is an important uh, political lesson for us to grasp in order to understand the way forward today. In other words, the building of the party, the communism that we need, the, the importance of theory, etc. All those qualities, if you like, developed and put forward by Lenin are an essential ingredient. That's why he's seen as, in, 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 from our point of view, one of the great teachers of Marx, Engels, Lenin and Trotsky, all of whom provide us with a colossal amount of uh, theoretical uh, uh, treasures in order to arm ourselves for the period that lies ahead. In other words, to carry through this proletarian revolution, which had been dreamed about uh, for, in the past, can become a reality. 
Thanks so much, Rob. Uh, one more time, I cannot recommend this book enough. It's big, it's two volumes, a thousand pages, but it's an absolute goldmine. Uh, everyone should pick up a copy. Anyone, certainly, who considers himself a communist, but even if you're a, a thinking progressive, if you're somebody who envisions a better world, you need to read and study this biography. It's got a huge amount of lessons, it's really engaging, and it's really fascinating. Now, the IMT is launching a campaign this year to mark Lenin's centenary, the centenary of his passing, called Lenin Lives. And this podcast is part of that campaign. We're going to be having regular episodes focusing on different aspects of Lenin's life and work and thought over the coming months. The next one, which will come out in a few weeks, will concern the myths about Lenin. So all the lies and slander that we touched on here will be dealing with some of the most common accusations Lenin faces, debunking them all. So to help us out with that, we've launched a new website as part of the Lenin Lives campaign. It's lenin.red. Again, I'll put a link in the description where you can send in some of the myths that you might have heard, perhaps on telly, maybe at school, perhaps from some of these history books that we've been discussing. So please do send us in some of the myths that you've heard about Lenin. You can also send them to our social media accounts um, and can you please hashtag them, Lenin Lives. Rob, thank you so much. One more time, pick up the book, In Defense of Lenin, link in the description. We'll see you next week with a new episode. That's all from me.